blessings on you on this important Easter weekend. I have a word of encouragement. And if you could share about seven minutes, I believe it would be worth our time to ponder the promise of Easter. Max Lakato here, and I'm wishing you the greatest of Easter weekends. When I was a youngster, my dad took the family to Arlington, Texas to visit the Six Flags Over Texas theme park. I cannot overstate my excitement. The highlight of my two stoplight town was a groundhog park. Our idea of entertainment was Dairy Queen. Six Flags was everything our little town was not. It was colorful, musical, and entertaining. At one point while riding a trolley, I turned to my father and I said, this is the most wonderful place I've ever seen. He responded, well, that's great, Max, but we're still in the parking lot. I had assumed the passenger shuttle was the big ride. I would have taken a tour of the entryway and called it a wonderful vacation. Good thing my dad was there to tell me there's more on the other side. That is God's message to you this Easter, my friend. He has a place for you, space for you, grace for you. And John tells us about it in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. You know, the Greek language has a couple of words that can be translated as new. One means new in time, but the other means new in form, in the sense that what was old has become obsolete and needs to be replaced by what is new. In such a case, the new is, as a rule, superior to the old. And that's the word that John used in this passage. The new earth, our new earth, will be a better version of the old, renewed to its intended Garden of Eden splendor. God will restore every atom, every animal, every galaxy to its glory. To do anything less would be to admit defeat. Our God is a God who rescues, who redeems, and yet another display of his authority will be seen because it will be time for a new start. John saw it coming, continuing in 21 of Revelation. I, John, saw the holy city of Jerusalem coming down from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. He calls the city a holy city. That means no lie will be uttered in 100 million years. No evil word will ever be spoken. No shady business deals. No unclean pictures will be seen. No corruption of life. It will be holy because everyone in the city will be holy. No nation will starve. No people will war. No tongue will gossip. No husband will cheat. No wife will chide. No bomb, no temper will explode. People won't fear dictators or muggings. We won't go in debt buying what we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't know. We won't beat ourselves up for stumbling on the day before because the day before we didn't stumble, nor will we stumble tomorrow or ever. That's heaven. No longer will there be any more curse, no more struggle with the earth, no more shame before God, no more tension between people, no more death, no more death. John goes on to say, The angel who talked to me held in his hand a golden measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And when he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. And then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick. Man, the size of Jerusalem, 1,400 miles large enough to contain the landmass from the Appalachians to the West Coast, Canada to Mexico, 40 times the size of England, 10 times the size of France, larger than India. And that's just the ground floor. The city stands as tall as it is wide. I don't know. Will God stack it as we do stories today? If so, Jerusalem will have 600,000 floors, ample space for billions of people, ample space for you. When did you discover the congestion of the world? Your boss can't find a place for you. The school had no space for you. Your dad had no time for you. There's not much space. Consequently, we get eliminated, cut, dropped, refused, and we grow cautious. Limited quantities make hoarders out of us. For fear of exhausting finances, we clutch our money. For fear of losing our job, we subvert an associate. For fear of 
losing land, we, we go to war. But with the dimensions of our soon-to-be home, God proclaims there's enough space for all. God has space for you. And God has grace for you. John says the city had great and high walls with 12 gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's still in Revelation 21. Who are these 12 sons of Israel whose names we read on the city gates? Well, Simeon and Levi were among them. And they were the two brothers who convinced a tribe of men to undergo circumcision and then three days into their recovery, attacked and killed them all, Genesis 34. Judah, another of the 12, mistook his daughter-in-law for a harlot, slept with her and impregnated her. Nine of the brothers conspired to kill younger brother Joseph, and they would have succeeded had Reuben not intervened. They sold him into slavery. Boy, this sounds more like a 3 a.m. nightclub crowd than it does a hall of fame of faith, yet these are the names on the gate of Jerusalem. And what about the names on the foundations? There's Peter, the apostle who saved his skin instead of his Savior. There's James and John who demanded VIP seats in heaven. There's Thomas, the dubious, who insisted on a personal audience with the resurrected Jesus. Their names make heaven's honor roll. These were the disciples who told the children to leave Jesus alone, told Jesus to leave the hungry alone, and who chose to leave Jesus to face his crucifixion alone. Matthew did, Peter did, Bartholomew did. Yet all their names appear on the foundations. Matthew's does, Peter's does, Bartholomew's does. The names of the 12 tribes and the apostles are unlikely material for heaven's engravings, but aren't we glad to know about them? We engrave monuments with the names of heroes and philanthropists and scholars and explorers. But what if we're none of these? What if our lives have been spent marred by addictions or anger or prison terms or problems? God says, I have grace for you. Not only is the holy city spacious and gracious, it is beautiful. The foundations will be inlaid with every kind of jewel, jasper, sapphire, chalcedony, emerald, sardonyx, sardius, and on and on. That's all in Revelation 21. And each gate leading to the city will be hewn from one great pearl. Now, we make jokes about the pearly gates, but we need to keep in mind that all other precious gems are metals or stones, but the pearl is a gem formed by the oyster, the only one formed by living flesh. And this humble oyster receives an irritation, and around the offending article that has penetrated or hurt it, the oyster builds a pearl, and that pearl is the answer of the oyster to the pain. The pearl is born out of the pain, so it will be with New Jerusalem. It was born out of the pain of Jesus. Throughout eternity, as you and I enter the gates of our holy city, we will think about our Savior who took on the sin of the earth so we can experience the glory of heaven. Speaking of our Savior, he will make the city splendid. The dimensions are great. The materials are stunning. The pearl in the gate, the gold in the streets. We've never seen anything like them, but it won't be the emeralds or structures that capture our hearts. It will be Jesus, and we will see him. And we will touch the scarred hands and hear the calm voice. The scripture says the throne of God and of his lamb will be in it and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face. That's chapter 22. Pause and personalize that message. Tell yourself, I will see his face. You will see God. You will see the one who has never not been, the one who has never given in, the one before whom all creation bows, you will see him in your glorified body that will never decay. You will see the God of all glory. And can you imagine the moment in which God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever, 21-4. No more cemeteries, death, no more oppression, depression or suicide, corruption, pollution or disruption. This is the destiny God has for you, my friend. And when he arose from the tomb on that Easter morning, Jesus opened the gates of heaven. He has a place for you, space for you, and grace for you. Receive it, won't you? God bless you.